welcome to Wildflowers in the Woods. Um, this is a webinar with the Vermont Land Trust. Um, oh, well, hold on a second. It's not, there we go. Um, my name is Katherine Hancock and Jack is also here. Jack, how do you say your last name? My last name is Minnick. Okay, I wasn't sure. If the, yeah. Um, and we are AmeriCorps service members. And what that means is, I'm sure you've probably heard of like the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, they're different national um, service organizations where you can get paired with a host site and kind of like uh, get a job done for different organizations across the whole country. Um, so we were paired with the Vermont Land Trust and I'm an education and outreach coordinator. So my service has been focused on getting uh, kind of like environmental programming in schools and field trips to different like public recreation areas in primarily the Northeast Kingdom is the region of Vermont that I'm serving in. Jack, what do you do? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jack. I serve as the land management coordinator down here in Brattleboro, Vermont. And my focus is uh, on Vermont Land Trust's native species restoration program. So uh, I was brought in to do invasive plant assessments and run invasive plant management plans for lands that Vermont Land Trust owns, as well as to do programming like this. Uh, so talking about native species and talking about um, invasive species and ways that we can um, control and manage invasive species and promote native species. So that's uh, my role here at Vermont Land Trust. Awesome. So yeah, um, Angie, she is our kind of communications team member who's been coordinating all of these online events and doing a really wonderful job with that. She approached us and was like, uh, we both have, Jack and I both have experience doing environmental education and outdoor education with students, elementary, middle school age, primarily, I would think. Right, Jack? Is that kind of the age range you've worked with before? Yeah. Yeah, elementary and middle school. Yeah, so we actually both um, have previously done AmeriCorps service with Teton Science School out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So we thought it'd be fun to co-teach this. Um, so again, if you've just joined, this is Wildflowers in the Woods for Beginners. I'm Catherine, Jack is with me here. Um, yeah, and today we just wanna go over kind of the goals of this presentation. So it is designed for beginners. So we've already had some great questions um, about like specific plant stuff that maybe Jack or I um, are just starting to learn about because we are kind of beginner wildflower enthusiasts too. Um, so today we're gonna go over basic flower structure for a couple minutes. We'll talk about 14 common Vermont wildflowers that are probably in your backyard or in your woods. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at two different points in the presentation. And if you feel like you are already a beginner and you've already kind of gotten to that level, you should definitely check out a previous webinar that is now recorded and on YouTube. And um, that is from our VLT ecologist, Liz Thompson. She did a wildflower talk that might go more in depth if that's something that you're wanting. Um, or you can check it out after this webinar too. So our goal for today is to just encourage everyone of all ages, students and older generations to enjoy nature, identify some flowers and to safely get outside. So um, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get started with the first flower, sound good? Sounds great. All right, so, oh, parts of a flower, sorry. So parts of the flower, this is just a very basic um, diagram that I found online. And this is, I believe, a lily. That's kind of um, the drawing here. And we have, of course, leaves here. Um, they're gonna look different for every type of flower that you come across. And a stem, and again, the stems will kind of be different, like thicknesses or toughnesses depending on what you're looking at. Um, we have these green little, they look like leaves or they could look like petals, but they're actually called sepals. Sepals are, um, they're special because they kind of protect the flower when it's starting to bud. And then when they open up, they're kind of at the base of the flower, holding it up, protecting it and keeping it um, open and, you know, um, supported. 
And then we have the stamen, and this is kind of the male reproductive part of the flower. It has the pollen. This little tip right here that my mouse is pointing at, that is the anther. That's where pollen is in the flower. It's that dusty yellow stuff. And then we have the pistil here. This is the female reproductive part of a flower. It is where, down here, where the eggs, the, um, I think they're called ovules, ovules. I always um, <laughs> get tongue-tied with that. But this is kind of where the seeds are of the flower. So um, usually up here, the pistil will be kind of sticky, and that's to help pollen stick down into it um, and pollinate. And then, of course, we have the petals, which, again, are going to look different on all types of different flowers. Um, but they're usually colorful and beautiful, and that is to attract um, pollinators like bees, other types of bugs. So yeah, um, that was very quick, basic. If we have more questions about them going forward, you can totally feel free to ask them. But I think we're just gonna jump right into our flower ID. So first we have, a few people have already talked about these in the Q&A when we were getting started, the trillium. So they have three petals you can see here. And then they have three sepals, those um, leaf looking things, that, but they're not leaves, they're technically sepals. And um, a way that I remember this is the tri and trillium means three. So you can remember easily, you have three petals and three sepals, and you can think three, tri, trillium. Um, and they can be red or like a deep burgundy color. It's usually um, generally thought of as trillium or like maroon. And then there are also white trillium that are kind of cream colored or white and then painted trillium are kind of red and white or like pink. They have um, sort of streaks of like red pink color. So yeah. The next flower is bloodroot. And this is a flower that if you are um, in Southern Vermont, you it's probably already, already flowered and gone to seed. Um, look for a big white creamy flower that opens uh, once it gets warm out during the day. And usually it'll be accompanied by a single large lobed leaf. So you can see if you're looking at the flower in the picture, that leaf in the background um, is usually pretty big and they often are in colonies. So there'll be a big bunch of them. Um, and typically they'll have eight to 12 petals with two sepals. And I really love this uh, flower because I, I just think it has such a strong image. So the name bloodroot um, comes from this liquid. So if you, if you ever pull out the root, um, which in ethically, maybe, maybe don't, just to help keep its uh, populations healthy. But if you ever do end up uh, pulling out a root, um, you'll see that there's typically like a, a kind of blood red to deep orange liquid um, present in the root, which um, was famously for, for uh, millennia used as dye um, and for various other purposes. So the herbalists in the room, this is a flower to look up to see its various uses. Cool, and yeah, you can definitely Google photos of the red blood root so that you don't have to like uproot every <laughs> blood root you come across. That's a good point, Jack. Yeah, and this one, oh. Oops, sorry, oh, we're going back. I think this is a, a, an interesting one to talk about with seed dispersal. So how its seed gets uh, essentially planted so that the flowers produce a small seed um, or a number of small seeds that have kind of an odor that attracts ants and the ants will, will eat the odorous part, um, the, the really smelly part of the seed and leave behind the actual seed. Um, and in doing that, they kind of carry the seed back to their, um, their home mound and leave the seed planted there to germinate in the spring. Cool. That's all. I did not know that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, moving on. Violets. So beautiful. This is actually a picture that I took last night on my little nighttime kind of evening walk. They have five petals. Um, and they can be 
purple they can be a light purple like almost a deep like royal blue like almost a purple blue that can be white like in this photo they can be really really light purple lavender so all beautiful colors that i love um so if you look at the leaves here i don't know if you can see my mouse they are almost like heart shaped kind of and they are serrated and the word serrated means that they kind of have like teeth looking edges, or you could kind of think of them as like jagged, or I'm sure you've seen like a serrated knife. They kind of have that type of edge. Um, so yeah, and then there's another little one that's sort of drooping over in the corner of this photo here. And um, something cool about violets is that you can remember their shape because there's this word called palmate, P-A-L-M-A-T-E, that is often used when talking about plants or leaves or flowers. Um, a palmate leaf or flower is going to kind of look like the palm of your hand with your five fingers. So you can imagine sort of like the middle of your hand, your palm is the middle of this flower and then it has five petals coming off of it from the middle. Um, and of course, my hand doesn't look exactly like a violet a flower, but it's, a, it's an interesting kind of um, mental image that you can think of. Um, and something else cool about flowers for all the herbalists in the webinar is that you can use the flowers and the leaves are, um, they're edible. You can use them in salads, jellies. You can use them as like um, kind of decorations in your dishes if you are into that. So yeah, they're pretty beautiful and they can make your um, and if you want more ideas for what to use them in, definitely uh, search that from like reputable herbalism websites. <laughs> Anything to add on violets, Jack? No, that was great. All right, thanks. Moving on. So these are uh, one of my favorite wildflowers in the spring are trout lilies. And um, I'm sure if you've been walking in the woods, at least in southern and central Vermont, lately you'll have seen these leaves. And it, it might be hard to tell from the photo, but um, you can look for these brown spotted leaves um, sticking up out of the ground. And there's some debate as to whether or not the leaves are the reason behind it being called a trout lily. So some people say that um, the brown spotting on the leaves resembles a trout skin. Um, other people say it coincides with trout fishing season. I'm not exactly sure when trout fishing season is in southern Vermont, but um, I'll let you decide which you agree with more. So the flowers have six yellow petals, and I, I took this photo with a hand lens that just showed the, that dusty brown pollen sticking out so nicely. Um, the flowers um, are kind of seldom. Usually you'll just see the leaves. Um, and if you are someone that really likes patterns, there is some evidence to suggest that the, the um, colony or the, or the large group of trout lily um, plants have a similar pattern that is distinct from other colonies. So like if one colony of trout lilies would have a similar brown spotted pattern um, versus another colony of trout lilies. Um, and I always like to think of this flower uh, by its other name, which is dog tooth violet. And I, I remember that because I think of the flower as like a dog kind of sticking out its tongue. You can see that um, it hanging down with, I think those are um, statements sticking out, but that's what I got for trout lily. Well, that, this is a great photo here um, on the right of the up close of the um, anthers, these little brown pieces. I'm quizzing myself. Um, and then what, this would be the pistol here? Cool. So if you wanted to get like a real life close up of those parts of a flower, Jack took a wonderful photo for you. Okay, next we have marsh marigold. So these are gonna be found in kind of wet areas like swamps, um, maybe like creek type places. I don't know, um, we had someone asking before the webinar began about marsh mallows. And I don't know if that's like an interchangeable name for marsh marigold. 
But anyways, they have five petals that are kind of round in these photos. They kind of have a little point to the top, but they're mostly round petals. And um, they have a lot of different stamen and pistils. And these flowers actually attract birds. So birds can also pollinate flowers, um, which I, I don't really think of as much. I usually think of like insects like bees and other bugs, but birds are attracted to the marsh marigold and um, will help pollinate them. So. Dwarf ginseng, ginseng, I should probably say, um, is a very small wildfire that we can find in our woods. Um, you'll notice these, this assemblage of, of tiny little white flowers, and that is called an umbel. Um, and I like to think of umbrella, because it has this kind of dome shaped. Um, these are really, really small. And with flowers, you can, depending upon their size, you can kind of ask the question, you know, who would be pollinating or visiting a flower that small? Um, and it's, I like to think of the metaphor of like shoes. You know, if you have really, really tiny shoes, only someone with really, really tiny feet are gonna be able to, to wear those shoes. And so a flower this small, who's really gonna be visiting this flower? Um, and it turns out gnats are, are a common pollinator for these flowers just because they're, they're so tiny that, you know, if you're, if you're an animal visiting it, you're gonna need to probably be about the size of a gnat to access whatever nectar might be coming from it. Um, the dwarf ginseng is quite popular with herbalists for edible roots. Um, and I think um, that's its big claim to fame. If you're walking around in the woods though, it's pretty hard to spot. So keep an eye out. It's gonna just be a, an inch or two off the ground is, is kind of how I commonly see it in Southern Vermont. Um, so it's a great one to spot when you're taking a break and you're sitting down and relaxing. Jack, that was such a great image of the shoes and the flower petals, like for the size of the pollinator. Yeah, I, it's, I ask that question every time I see a flower. It's like, what, what would work there? Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's a great way to kind of start being investigative. Like, it's hard to become an expert overnight, but the more that you kind of walk around and like think about these things and just like what you observe and what you notice, I think that that can bring us a long way to becoming, to feeling like we're really confident experts on whatever mm -hmm. we're observing in nature. So I guess I want to encourage us all, me too, moving forward through the PowerPoint. If you, um, when you see a photo, if we don't say in the slide what would pollinate it, maybe you can start brainstorming. That would be really cool. You can put your guesses in the comments if you want. So next we have Colt's foot. They are this beautiful bright yellow and they look really similar to dandelions, but they are different. They are one of the first flowers to bloom um, in springtime. Um, so you, I see them, there's a ton out by my road right now. Um, they can close at night and on rainy days, the flowers, so they open back up um, when it's sunny again. And the name Colt's Foot you can see down in the bottom right corner, I have some photos of the leaves from Colt's foot. They look like little horseshoes for little uh, baby horses or colts. So that's how they got their name. And like I said, they often grow near roads. So um, in like disturbed areas where there's been a human disturbance. So maybe like near a parking lot or a field by a road, like in a ditch. Um, these are all very common places to find Colt's foot. And then on the next slide, I just have dandelion on the left and Colt's foot on the right to kind of give you a side-by-side -side comparison of the two flowers. So dandelions um, kind of, I think of are like a little bit puffier. They kind of look like a pom-pom to me, like a cheerleading pom-pom or maybe a craft pom-pom. Um, they just look a little fluffier. If I look really close, you can tell that they have different looking, um, it looks like they're anthers, these tiny little like dark gold dashes. They're a lot more spread out, whereas here in Colt's Foot, it's a lot more concentrated right in the middle of the flower. 
um, with like smaller, thinner little petals. So yeah, um, I thought that was a good comparison for a side by side. And um, I think it's commonly thought that Colt's foot is invasive. Um, but in talking more and like learning from Liz, the VLT ecologist that I um, have kind of been getting help with for this presentation, um, she was telling me that Colt's foot aren't really invasive to uh, Vermont, but they are just not native. So they're not something that grew here uh, naturally on their own. They were, I guess, brought from another place, but they aren't necessarily invasive. Like they're not threatening other plants from growing healthily. Great. So this is a, a pretty common flower. And again, my region is, is kind of southeastern New Hampshire, southern Vermont. And so it might look very different where you are. This might not be a flower that you see that often. Or it could be everywhere, um, depending upon where you live, but I'm referencing where I do. So uh, for bellworts, which is a, is a type of flower, um, or a type of flowers, uh, look for kind of small flowers that nod or hang down and so you can see in the photo you've got uh, this this yellow kind of cream colored flower kind of drooping over um, and the way I usually remember the name bellwort is I like to think of the, the flowers as looking like little bells um, and typically you look for six pale yellow or cream colored petals although they're often kind of closed so it's helpful to to get down close and uh, maybe lift it up with your fingers to, to look and count the petals. Um, and a nice note, the other kind of common name for these flowers are Mary Bells. Um, and you just, you got a picture just walking through the woods and, and seeing all these little flowers tinkling as bells. Um, I know that the, the general thing is they're like kind of ringing to announce the end of winter, but I always think they kind of look sad, like as if they were really enjoying kind of the cold months. Um, but I'll let you decide which, which camp you fall in. Nice. Okay, now we have hepatica. So you can find these in Vermont. They kind of are present all down the, um, the like east coast, I guess. I don't consider the south like the east coast, but whatever, um, regionalism. Anyways, they have long oval petals like you can see in these photos. Um, and they could be pink, white, purple. In these photos, I have pink and white, or sorry, pink and purple shown. They're going to have six to eight petals, um, and the, they have many stamen and pistils. So if you look close, um, these white pieces here, these would be, these yellow, these are the stamen and the pistils. So they're very obvious, especially like really all these pictures do a great job of showing that. Um, and they were named hepatica for these, in this photo here to the left, you can see these way better. These three lobed kind of purplish red leaves that grow with them, they were thought to look like the human liver. And um, hepatica, that name, I think it must mean something to do with the human liver. And a fun fact is that like, I guess, years and years and years ago when people would find plants that they thought looked like a certain body part or maybe a human organ they thought okay this plant must help cure or uh, keep this part of the body healthy so if we find a plant that looks like the liver it probably helps keep the liver healthy so they would use this plant for medicines when they thought that people had problems with their livers. So that's where the name comes from. On to my favorite wildflower, Jack in the Pulpit. Um, has a great name. Uh, the, the kind of the story with the name um, gets into essentially this unique flower structure that Jack in the Pulpit has. So the photo on the left, um, you'll notice there's this kind of drooping looking, what looks like a leaf drooping over. And then in the photo on the right, my thumb there is, is lifting up that drooping thing that kind of looks like a leaf. Um, so that thing that looks like a leaf is actually part of the flower. And that is um, known as the spathe. 
and that is like a hood. And that hood, the striped part there you can see in the photo, is the pulpit or stage um, in the name of the flower. And the jack or the, the flower, the actual like flower part, is this little nub right here, this purple nub. Um, <laughs> and that is uh, it's called a spadix. And that's actually tons and tons of tiny little flowers um, clustered together in that nub. Um, and this just has such a fascinating pollination strategy. So you've got all these little flowers clustered here on this nub. And normally when, when there isn't a pesky human looking at it, this, uh, this hood is kind of draped over. And so um, insects will, will smell whatever smell. I think it's usually a fungal smell this, this plant gives off. And they'll go up underneath the hood and they'll be looking for this smell and they'll get trapped there. They'll get trapped right next to, to the jack or the spadix and they'll kind of bounce around looking for a way to get out. Um, but they'll be prevented by this hood, which is folded over. And on the, the male plants, the plants that have a pollen, eventually if, if those insects are small enough, they'll realize there's a little hole at the bottom of this uh, pulpit or this hood and they'll fly out and they'll survive and they'll, they'll go look for another plant and probably get tricked by another jack in the pulpit. Um, and, but on female plants, unfortunately, there isn't a hole at the bottom for them to escape. And all of that action of trapping insects helps distribute pollen um, by covering these terrified insects with pollen. So if you see these in the woods and they're really common, um, I, I like to just kind of for fun look, lift up the hood and uh, look in and uh, especially on female plants, you can kind of towards the end of spring, you'll see lots of, of dead insects in there, um, which is just, it's kind of a fascinating strategy. Um, but I always also like to think, going back to the image of the name, you know, who would Jack be talking to, to himself with the hood on? You know, that's kind of a lonely, a lonely stage. Cool. That's so funny, Jack. Um, is this, wait, can you see my mouse? Is this where yes. the flower would be? Like that's where it is. It's just hard to tell. Yeah. Cool. So that right where your mouse is, that's what gets lifted up in the photo on the right. Well, cool. I hope everyone at home can see that. Nice. All right. Moving on to squirrel corn. I love this flower. I've never seen it out in the wild, but I have researched it because I think it's so interesting. So squirrel corn have these, they're kind of heart-shaped uh, petals and blooms, and they're very beautiful to me. They grow in moist soil, so I'm thinking that means you'll probably find them kind of more in forested, covered areas where the light is not getting through the canopy of trees as much. So um, the the forest floor is staying more uh, damp and wet and moist. Um, this plant is apparently poisonous. I don't have any personal experience with that. I've never tried to like eat any part of it, but just so you know, be careful. Um, and the name squirrel corn comes from these tubers, which are in the photo on the right. They're kind of yellow. They look like corn kernels. They um, cluster around the roots. So they're underground you can tell this photo they were they have dirt around them they were pulled up from underground but they look like corn kernels that a squirrel could eat so that's why it's called squirrel corn and um for those of you that don't know what tuber what a tuber is it's kind of just like a a piece of a plant that has all this storage of kind of like starch and um, nutrients that help the plant survive through maybe colder and darker months like through winter so to give you maybe a more accessible example, a potato is a type of tuber. So, just so you know. So yeah. Have you seen squirrel corn before, Jack? I've not. This is kind of a, a new one for me, so I haven't, I've been keeping my eye out, but no luck so far. Yeah, I wanna see it. So Spring Beauties, uh, if you are already kind of in, in Southern Vermont and Central Vermont, the, uh, the time to see Spring Beauties is, is slowly drawing to close, or at least I, they've started kind of disappearing from my woods. 
Um, they're really, really small and easy to miss. So don't, don't stress out if you can't, if you can't find them. Um, they typically have white to pink petals with lots of pink to purple streaks on the petals. Um, and the best way to spot them I found is typically when I'm like struggling up a really steep slope. Um, you know, the kind where you're on your like hands and knees kind of crawling up. They'll usually be the flowers that are like right in my face. Um, that's kind of when I tend to notice them. But uh, they sometimes too, you'll just see like huge carpets of them. Um, I know I was in Andover the other week and, and there was just, you know, it, it was just the whole forest floor was covered with them. So um, I always appreciate seeing them on a walk. That's awesome. Um... I heard recently that these purple pink uh, streaks on the petals, they like kind of help guide pollinators to the, um, to the stamen and pistil. Wow, yeah. that's really cool. I know, and then again, it kind of supports my, the like things I've read about really um, attention grabbing flowers, having purple-ish and yellow colors, I don't know. Um, the jury might be out on if that's like the cold hard truth but anyway so next is another really fun one that I've never seen in real life that, that I really want to see it's called Dutchman's Breaches um, and I'm sure some of you know or all of you might know breaches is another fancy pants word for pants Breaches. Um, so these flowers hang from kind of a stalk or a stem that grows above the leaves that um, kind of grow with the plant. The reproductive parts of the flower are in these yellowish inner petals. So you're going to find the stamen and pistil in that area because they're kind of, they kind of hang down. So you can think like, what would they be like if they were upright? They would have the stamen and pistil in this yellow part. Um, and yeah, they look like upside down pants. And I just think that that's funny. Um, that's why they have the word or the name breaches. So yeah, I had never seen them in real life, but I really want to. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> just thinking about how funny it is that Dutchman's breaches look like pants, aren't you? <laughs> it's the image just sticks out so clearly in my brain. Yeah. Um, so wild ginger is another favorite. Um, I, I've, I've lived in Minnesota and, and that's where I've seen it a lot. I haven't seen it too much here in, um, in Southern Vermont or Southeastern New Hampshire yet. Um, but it's a, it's also a pretty small wildflower. Um, unlike a lot of the other ones that we've talked about, you'll probably notice the leaf before you notice the flower. Um, and so the photo on the bottom right gives you kind of a good idea um, of this cup-like leaf that's kind of like heart-shaped. Um, I, I always think it looks kind of similar to Colt's, but, um, and the flower is usually going to be tucked underneath. So you can see in the photo to the right, it's down at the ground level, um, which is really interesting. And, and when I started finding them out in Minnesota, I was always wondering, like, why would you put the flower on the ground? Like, that seems to be like a little backwards, um, but it's, uh, I can't even find out, like it's, it's their pollination strategy. So um, like a lot of wildflowers, it'll have a very distinct smell that is used to attract the pollinator that it wants to attract. Um, and wild ginger uh, to a number of insects smells, I guess like rotting meat. I've never smelled that smell, but um, apparently they have. Uh, and that's used to, to attract essentially ground insects um, who will wander over to this flower, which is right on the ground. Um, and it, another interesting thing to note is these three, what look like petals are actually sepals. There's that word again. Um, so that wild ginger's big claim to fame for us humans is just that it's uh, many parts of the plant have a similar taste to ginger. Um, and like with, with all the, the plants that we talk about that have edible parts, um, definitely uh, make sure to use a reference guide and make sure to be with someone that, that can confidently ID the plants. Um, I know that question has been coming up a lot and I want to emphasize that with wild ginger. 
Yeah, this is, that's a great reminder, Jack. Um, that is a really interesting thing that you said about how it's on the ground. Um, and you said it smells like rotting meat, right? Or that's what mm -hmm. it's thought to smell like. Um, that's interesting because when I was reading before this presentation, I read that beetles are the types of bugs that are attracted to the flowers that have like a musty or spicy scent. So that makes sense that they would be attracted to the wild ginger and crawl on the ground. They can't really fly. So thanks for being here. This is really fun for me and Jack. Um, I was supposed to be teaching in classrooms in school settings a lot this season and obviously that got derailed. So this type of thing is really fun for me to get to do. Uh, and I would love to add Thank you all for all of these questions. This is making, you know, when we, when we think about this, we're like mainly focused on, on what we're going to be saying. And so this is just such good, um, these are such good questions. And this is exactly what we want people to, to take away from webinars is partly the information, but also just the ability to generate lots of questions. Thank you all again for participating today. And yes, definitely thank you for the questions. It's really inspiring to me to see so much engagement and like Catherine said at the beginning um, this is about inspiring curiosity and getting to know your la natural landscape and we're so glad that we got to explore that a little bit with you today I do want to thank you all again and again thank you to Catherine and Jack take care have a great afternoon thank you